Well, welcome everybody. Uh, the Ohio Fair Lending Forum. This is our 34th year of doing these events. And I must say, I think when you say LLC and housing and grading properties in Cleveland, we get a turnout. We had a large turnout. We get a lot of people at this event. Before we get started, I want to thank the members of the, uh, the planning committee and especially Frank Ford who helped put this together and got everybody talking and working together. It's always tricky. You have a lot of personalities and you're working through these plans and programs that I want to shout out to Frank for his work on this forum. Also, the other members of the planning committee who worked on this uh, were part of this work that we are doing. And today we welcome Noah Cook, who is our super graduate of Cleveland State University in dance and community organizing. And Nasha, who is our active person who's been with us for a year, a little just about a year with VISTA. And if you don't know, VISTA is the equivalent of the Peace Corps and has been with us for many years. And we appreciate all the work that VISTA has done for us. But most importantly, grading and maintaining housing is an important part of what we do here in Greater Cleveland especially the city of Cleveland, because it's the largest investment that people make and it's the wealth that they transfer to their family. So the more that we can do to maintain that wealth, the more wealth we'll create in the community. So I'll turn it over to you, Frank. I guess you're the first one to go. And uh, you can introduce the members of the panel. And if you have questions or you wanna make a comment, put it in the chat. We'll try to pick it up and make sure that we get it. But we'll take the questions at the end of the forum. Thanks so much and look forward to everybody participating. Actually, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony because he's moderating the panel and I think he should do the introductions. Okay, Tony, you're on. Great, uh, thank you very much. And, and Chip, certainly thank you. These forums have been uh, amazing over the years. Uh, having been both at the CDC and at the council, um, very informative, um, educational, and, and really helps guide us as we go through. Um, and today's uh, panel, uh, with no exception, really is going to uh, talk about how um, really monitoring these properties makes such a huge difference in our communities and, and help us in many different ways. I've been doing surveys for three decades when I was a CDC director and then in council, and it really has helped guide us in how we invest money. It guided us in how we really are working with our residents. Um, and then sadly, it helped guide us when going after and, and exposing fraudulent lending and then prosecuting folks. And then now, how do we raise more resources and how, how do we be more innovative like the BOR uh, through the county, um, the county land bank, uh, demolition monies raised through Western Reserve, et cetera. So today's forum, we're really gonna uh, talk about how the survey findings in the context of other public data and Frank Ford's gonna really um, uh, bring that home for us. Um, and the city uh, survey results with Tim Colby um, uh, drilling down on the survey itself and what the findings were. And then uh, the background of the survey, um, when we have uh, Director Martin and Isaac Robb, uh, Isaac's uh, story map is really compelling um, and, and probably added more gray hairs to him. But uh, the, the overall, the panel today will, will provide a lot of information on um, how the survey began and then uh, where we landed. And then we'll have questions and follow up um, with Councilman Harsh leading off on that. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Director Martin to talk about the value of the surveys and then uh, Isaac Robb to talk about the story map. Thanks Director so much. Martin. Thank you so much, um, Tony. We really appreciate you moderating this panel. Um, this was the most important thing I could have done starting this position was to get an assessment of where we were with all of the um, the properties in Cleveland and taking this snapshot in time, it's going to give us a jumping off point for us to retool code enforcement to pivot toward a proactive direction and away from a reactive direction, which is how the department has functioned for many decades. Uh, so the Department of Building and Housing has been a complaint driven organization for, for much of its existence. Um, and I feel that this is a missed opportunity. So the purpose of, of spearheading this survey. And I think we've we've taken this survey in a little bit different direction than prior surveys uh, under the great leadership of Isaac Robb and the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. We, we asked more questions of this survey than any in, in the history of the city. Um, so we were assessing buildings for lead risk as well as looking at property condition, vacancy and occupancy and the things that you would expect us to do 
but we were also looking at infrastructure. So we were looking at curbs and street trees and fire hydrants and you know what what are the conditions out there so that we can use um, uh, th the resources we have to proactively address these ground conditions. And so what we're in the middle of right now, and um, Tim and um, I know Tim might speak more on this, is retooling code enforcement generally, using the results of this survey to drive what we do next. So you'll see that there's a lot of C properties, there's a lot of D and F properties, you know, so targeting a response to that. And we've already started deploying resources around this. So our demo bureau is very focused right now on the F properties and making sure all of those are in the pipeline to condemnation if they can't be saved. And then with C properties, we have an unprecedented opportunity with ARPA funds that will be hitting the streets hopefully this fall to deploy those resources and help our owner occupants rebuild their houses while also taking a no holds barred approach to predatory investors who've come in and purchased so many properties in the city of Cleveland uh, with no accountability. And so we intend to hold them very accountable. And one of the ways of doing that is, you know, we, we've been working with a, a cross collaboration of different stakeholders, including many on this call, to look at existing legislation in the city of Cleveland and look at ways to reform that. And so we anticipate having about seven pieces of proactive legislation uh, coming before council shortly, and we intend to use that to uh, modernize our approach to especially tacking, tackling bulk investors. And so um, that, that's a little bit about the impetus. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end and um, looking forward to the discussion today. Thank, thank you, Director, um, and appreciate the focus on uh, being strategic and how we use that. Um, as we go to these presentations, uh, just want to let folks know that uh, these presentations will be posted online. Um, so uh, we'll be able to have access to them uh, and also let folks know that um, as we have questions at the end, we'll make sure we'll, we'll be able to get back to most everyone that uh, focuses on that. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the manager of this process, uh, Isaac, to uh, talk about um, the survey and uh, I'll go through his story map. Thank you very much, uh, Director Martin and Tony. Appreciate the introduction. I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see the story map. Okay. All right. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. So it's wonderful to see so many people that we've had the opportunity to work with. Um, over the years, as Tony said at the beginning of the call, you know, these property inventories aren't new. It's something that has been going on for, for decades. But what is really exciting and powerful is that at no time in history has it ever been easier to collect data, to store data, to interpret data, analyze data, and to share data. So what we'll be sharing today is sort of a, the first pass that our team sort of undertook to analyze this data. I had the opportunity to work as a property uh, surveyor in 2015, right when I moved to Cleveland. It was an incredible way to see every street, um, talk to a lot of different people and really get an understanding for the different neighborhood dynamics and especially around residential housing. This project is a little bit different you know, Director Martin said that this was a high priority for, for her, the Bibb administration and her team. And it was incredible to have the support and the leadership from the Bibb administration on this project from the onset. Often a lot of our, you know, sort of public workers and civil servants don't get the level of credit that they deserve. But this project kicked off in October when we had the press conference announcing it. You know, everyone was getting ready to bundle up. And we had, you know, dozens of city building and housing employees, people from MOCAP, from community development. And then later on in the project, there were numerous um, healthy homes inspectors from local CDCs helping on the data collection as well. And so I would just like to say a special thanks to all the surveyors um, that really were dedicated to collecting this data, especially during a Cleveland winter. Admittedly, this winter wasn't as uh, strenuous as some winters could be, but they still went out there 
without complaint and did a great job collecting, collecting this information. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't thank the funders. This was something that while the city and CDCs contributed their staff, the, the city did not have to come up with any discretionary funding. This was all provided by Rocket Community Fund, WISC of Cleveland, as well as the Cleveland Foundation. Um, I would also like to highlight two incredible partners in this process, one being the NeoCandu team at Case Western Reserve University and the Neighborhood Stabilization Tool. For those of you on the call, um, I highly recommend this tool as a way, especially if you're in community development or public service, as a way to collect and collaborate with publicly accessible data. Once this pro property inventory was complete, the data was shared immediately with our partners at Case Western. So this data is live and can be accessed at the parcel level and you can combine a myriad of resources there. I would also like to highlight the team at Regrid. If you're trying to do similar property data collection with a really robust data set that already exists, the Regrid tool is a really powerful one. We've been using them on our projects for over eight years now. We do these types of projects throughout the state and they're just a great partner. Uh, all of us might not be lucky enough to have a GIS team or an ARC GIS enterprise account. So this is a way to work. You can get a pretty low cost um, account and, and collect whatever type of information you would like. Today though, we'll be talking primarily on the results. And I'm happy to answer, answer any questions on the methodology at the end on, on how we collected data and the questions that Director Martin highlighted. We had close to 50 uh, questions. As you can see here, we can highlight the results both on the neighborhood level as well as the city council ward level. Just if you're playing around with this link, um, it's fairly easy to zoom in and out using the toggle on the lower right. Um, and you can expand that uh, to whatever geography or scale that you would like. So while we've done a citywide property inventory in 2015, this is a, a huge, uh, a huge undertaking that's close to 163,000 parcels. And this really highlights the level of care that we are trying to promote in partnership with the BIB administration. Um, without measuring these types of conditions, it's hard to make informed public policy decisions. We like to say that data doesn't make us smarter, but it does keep us more informed. And so here you can see that the majority of those 167,000 parcels are occupied structures. You can obviously go a little bit deeper into that and in which structures are residential versus commercial, things like that. But I would also like to highlight that since our 2015 property inventory and, and Frank and Tim are really going to dive into more of the granular results, we continue to see a lot more vacant land, especially on the inner east side of the city of Cleveland. Of the, the occupied structures that we highlighted, the good news is that the majority are still in sort of excellent, good, and fair condition. Um, of the 66% of overall parcels, that 108,000, you know, the vast majority fall within the sort of stable category, which is good, again, for a product, proactive code enforcement standpoint. We really want to make sure that resources are allocated and targeted to those owner-occupied housing, people that have lived through um, some pretty difficult economic times, whether it be from the foreclosure crisis, um, to formerly redlining in their neighborhoods to what we've been dealing with with the COVID pandemic and things like that. So addressing you know local owner-occupied structures, making sure people have resources there, but then recognizing that there still are um, significant levels of vacancy in our city. And so the vacant structures are more likely to have a myriad of issues that Frank and others have studied for a long time. So really being able to discern between who is owner occupied, which properties are rentals, and then which ones are vacant abandoned, and how can they be brought back into local control to either be rehabbed or, and often the case for those more distressed properties, you know, de residential demolition is still is still a high need. Um, we did a comparison though of the occupied structure with vacant structure, unsurprising, but 
you know, vacant structures tend to receive lower grades than those that are, are occupied. Again, the proactive code enforcement, if something does go from occupied to vacant, it's critical that resources and that that is addressed, whether it's a local owner or an out-of-state owner, there really needs to be a lot of accountability because houses can deteriorate in, in pretty quick fashion. So again, I won't spend too much time on the methodology, but here's some sort of highlights throughout the city and different neighborhoods on properties that received you know, an A grade versus a B grade versus a C grade and comparing those that are vacant and receiving that categorization versus those that are occupied. Those vacant Ds and Fs are obviously of great concern as are those occupied um, Cs, Ds and Fs. Those are folks that are in most need of, of resources in real time. And I apologize, I'm having a Zoom video as well as the story map up might lead to a little bit of lag in our, in our results. Out of state ownership, we worked with the database at NST to determine tax mailing addresses that were outside of the state, whether it's LLC or an individual. And again, unsurprisingly, while out of state ownership is relatively evenly dispersed throughout the city, um, the ownership by grade does is significantly worse for out of state owners versus versus local owners. There's been a lot of press, a lot of anecdotal information. Um, we know sort of who some of the larger bad actors are, but this really helps on a singular parcel level to address those types of speculative activity that continue to wreak havoc in our local, local housing community. Uh, the Bib administration and many others are also, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to lead hazards and abatements. And obviously we have housing stock that is very, very old. Um, I believe over two thirds of our, our housing stock, you know, um, of our occupied housing stock is pre-1978 and 75% of the total housing stock was built pre-1978 where there could be lead hazards within. So looking at specific uh, issues, obviously lead placards, um, what was important here is not so much that these houses were placarded, but are the houses that building housing and environmental health watch and others are placarding? Are those placards staying up or are, are people coming in, removing them and things like that? So lead placarding is obviously the first and, and greatest way to see if there are those lead hazards, but we also wanted to look at structures that were coded for having peeling paint. That's obviously a, a big indicator. You can cross-reference that with the age of the structure. Um, bare soil, especially on vacant land, um, if that lead paint can, can chip and be um, found on adjacent properties, that can be another health hazard as well. And through all of this sort of macro data, I hope people are really thinking long and hard about the interesting um, questions that can be answered. You know, for example, we, we, we focus a lot on the, the building structures, a lot of class and race um, analysis are done, whether it's through academic researchers or others. But I hope all of you are thinking about new ways to use this data. One thing, you know, we recognize there's bias in any sort of data collection or any project of this nature, but, you know, what would it look like for these areas with peeling paint to have um, a deeper analysis if they are female head of household, if they are single earner household, if there are children um, within that census tract, things like that. So the possibilities of data analysis truly are endless. And we hope that, that those of you on this call um, come away with your own questions that we haven't considered. Um, but one that we wanted to highlight here, you know, that's just, it's a pretty obvious, but really, you know, harmful thing is, you know, this yellow dot is the Madison Community Elementary School. And then here are areas or houses and structures that have been placarded for lead, properties that have bare soil or peeling paint. So if we're expecting and hoping that we have true safe routes to schools where kids can walk ride their bikes or things of that nature, you know, if they're walking by condemned houses with peeling paint and active lead hazards, that really um, exacerbates the negative health outcomes that children that are going to our schools experience on, on a daily basis. Um, vacant lots, I mentioned that sort of from a higher level, 
but the vacant lots continue to increase there to 20% of the total parcels. Many of those lots are owned by the Cleveland City Land Bank uh, within the Community Development Part Department. We asked some more specific questions this time around on if properties were improved, if they were distressed. We know, um, and again, all of our colleagues on Cleveland City Council that vacant lots tend to get have a higher propensity for um, illegal dumping. It's easier for truck, trucks and demolition crews to illegally dump um, on our, our streets. That's why, as Director Martin mentioned, we asked a lot of infrastructure questions around sidewalks, what the curb material was, is there a curb cut, things of that nature. Obviously, the city crews do a, a heroic job of trying to mow and maintain all the vacant land in the city, but that is sort of a never never ending task with a lot of really long term uh, implications for how we not only stabilize housing markets, but how do we stabilize the land um, that that is interspersed throughout all of our all of our neighborhoods and communities. Illegal dumping is an issue, but so is car parking. I'm sure everyone's call, whether you're on the C at a CDC or a neighbor or a council person, recognize how prevalent that can be in uh, in our city. But also there are a lot of people working really hard to improve their their lots and their the land within their neighborhood. Obviously, representing the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, we are big proponents of increasing local ownership through side yard expansions, through reforestation to increase our urban tree canopy, and through alternative ecologically sensitive interventions that really um, can benefit neighborhoods that might not have that direct ROI in a tax base like a occupied house would, but having a community garden brings um, significant types of more qualitative improvements and community connections. So we wanted to make sure that those were, were highlighted across the city uh, as well. And again, these improvements can take numerous, numerous forms. We also then um, were able to do an analysis on hotspots. This is a way to show uh, from a statistical significant standpoint, and this is maybe where my, my bandwidth is lagging a little bit, but hotspots are, are areas that show high concentration of vacant land in close proximity to one another. So this could be useful, whether it be for um, rehabbing or new development or um, integrating more sort of rewilding and greening initiatives that, that we are we are interested in. So again, there are sliding, this is a sliding toolbar to show where those those hot spots are in and you can zoom in on different different areas uh, based on on your interest. Uh, the other thing that I would like to highlight before I hand it over to the other panelists is you know we really want to um, share with you like how this property data can really align with existing city initiatives. We spent a little bit of time talking about things like the lead safe initiative or things um, with proactive code enforcement, but there are other types of initiatives that the city is really leading on. One being that we're really passionate about is the 15 minute city initiative that's coming out of city planning. And this is again a way to make sure people have all of the amenities that they need within a 15 minute walk or bike ride of where they live. So how can these vacant distressed properties or vacant lots um, help inform where strategic investments are needed, where that concentration of amenities also exists? And then if you have an area that you want to be a 15 minute city, what are the conditions of the sidewalks there? Are the sidewalks in good shape? Um, is it easy for someone who's eight years old or 80 years old to be able to traverse their street to make it to the grocery store or the library? And how can this data working with MOCAP, Public Works and others outside of building and housing um, really take a more comprehensive, proactive and data-driven approach in their neighborhoods to address a lot of things that residents you know, will call their council people or their CDCs about in uh, a really high level of frequency. So again, um, this is kind of a higher higher level overview. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention here sort of aerial imagery of uh, the urban tree canopy. Again, this is something that we're working with the Cleveland Tree Coalition to expand to 30% by 2040. And you can see the dearth of urban trees 
in the city of Cleveland versus our surrounding region and how that you can overlay it with vacant land. So I'm more than happy to answer other questions. Um, I just want to say again, thank you to the city administration. They were incredible partners. Uh, Frank continues to do wonderful research, team at NST. Um, it took about six months to collect all this data, a lot of long days. Um, Adrian Marty was the program lead on this and Sadie Jones and Nina Jeffries really led a lot of the work, especially on this beautiful story map. So I'd like to thank my colleagues there as well. I will hand it back over to Tony to uh, hand it off to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. And uh, certainly the storyboard is full of information. And as people can look on the links, um, they'll be able to see a lot of. Tony, you just muted yourself. I think Frank did that on purpose. That's yeah. All. <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much, Isaac. Uh, uh, the story, the storyboard really is a, a, a compelling uh, piece to watch, and I think hopefully folks will go to that link and and see the great work and how much detail is in there. If you can just go back a little bit to the beginning on the on the surveyors, just really want to highlight who the surveyors were, um, how many folks you had out there, um, real quick. Yeah, so most of the surveyors came from the city of Cleveland, primarily building and housing. We tried to have 25 surveyors out every day. Um, some days, you know, we weren't able to achieve that. And then we had about a dozen Healthy Homes Initiative folks uh, join the team after the first of the year. So it really was a, an all hands uh, approach and, and we couldn't have done it without the committed staff of the city of Cleveland. Thank you. And I think even though the, the survey itself was still a kind of a, a sidewalk survey, the level of professionals that you had out there and that uh, uh, the, the housing director helped uh, bring about um, really says a lot about the in-depth of the of the work that's done. And we'll, we'll see that shortly. Just a, a quick note, you, you mentioned the 15-minute city. Um, I always want to make sure we advocate that the 15-minute city is just, isn't just a, a pedestrian and walking and biking. It also includes transit. Um, and Mayor Bibb, uh, has had done a number of presentations around that 15 minute city. So we don't want to lose our public transportation folks out of this equation. And yeah, you... I, I get in trouble for that too, Tony. So thank you for, <laughs> for highlighting the access to high frequency transit. That's a key component. Yeah, yeah. There's a, some great initiatives that are going on with our public transit and RTA. Um, and then also you mentioned a number of uh, different initiatives that were uh, overlaid into this um, and, and want to make sure we recognize uh, Clevelot.org, um, some great work on uh, looking at uh, uh, repurposing vacant land and, and how do we do that in the process involved with that. Um, we'll make sure we put up a link for that. And then also uh, Mayor Bibbs, the, the Southeast Targeted Areas Investment Strategy, which is gonna direct millions of dollars in the Southeast and some of these hardest hit neighborhoods. So um, a lot of great work here. So thank you very much, Isaac. Um, and then uh, next up uh, we have, um, really some of the meat and potatoes uh, of this and a lot of detailed work and the great work that uh, uh, Tim Kobe has done. Um, and he'll be able to go through in, in much greater detail on uh, uh, drilling down on, on the results of this survey. Tim? Thanks, Tony. Uh, so my laptop decided it wasn't gonna cooperate today, so I don't have a camera, but I think I should be okay on my desktop. And everybody should be seeing uh, my presentation here, hopefully. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. All right, um, so let's just skip ahead here. Um, so some of this stuff is I, Isaac already covered in his presentation, so I'll maybe move a little bit quicker through that. Um, but then, um, and I just want to point out that the, the story map is great. So, you know, please go ahead, check that out, take your time there. Uh, like Isaac mentioned, you can zoom in and out. If you have a particular neighborhood you're interested in, um, you know, go check it out. I took a more um, holistic view for the city as a whole. Um, and I'm just going to try and kind of highlight um, some of the results, particularly from the B&H perspective um, here in our department. But then I also try and look at uh, kind of like what other city departments might be uh, interested in. Um, so Isaac already kind of covered all this. Um, but, you know, I just want to say thank you to Land Conservancy for being a great partner in this. Um, internally at the city, we had B&H, we had uh, Mayor's Office of Capital Projects, Community Development, 
um, and Urban AI has really stepped in here to help us uh, with some of the results. Uh, CDC stepped up to help us with their uh, with staffing by giving us healthy home staff people. And uh, thank you to our funders. Um, another thing that Isaac touched on here, and I think where we're really at with the process now is we're kind of in this um, analysis piece, moving into the operationalized piece for, for us in, in B&H anyways. Um, so we've kind of done this initial overview um, and part of, you know, the presentation here today is, you know, people maybe like point out things that we didn't quite see or forgot about. Uh, what other kind of data can we incorporate into this? And then, you know, how can we use this to improve? Uh, Director Martin O'Toole already talked about uh, VPU working on the vacant Ds and Fs. Um, and then kind of thinking about that pivot that the director talked about to be even more proactive, uh, we'll want to look at uh, the bulk of those C-graded properties. So then what, what did we find? And, you know, Isaac already talked about some of this, but I'll cover it again. That way, if it didn't quite hit for you the first time, maybe it'll hit the second time. Um, but I'll just point out that 92% of structures were uh, occupied. Almost 54% were graded A or B. So, you know, like half of the, half the structures in the city are what we would consider in good condition. Then we have this other big bulk of structures that were graded C. So this is 37% of all surveyed structures or just over 43,000 parcels. So those are the ones for us in BNH that we really wanna focus on in terms of code enforcement. We wanna make sure those do not slip into that D category. We wanna keep them C's or even uh, push them up into the B category. And then we have this, uh, this small group of about 4,800 structures that were graded D or F and uh, appeared to be vacant at the time of the survey. Now, those are the ones that we need to send BPU out to double check. Um, are they condemnable? Do we need to raise them? Are they good candidates for rehab? Uh, that's what we're gonna start working on figuring out. So now to get some maps of how this looks. So the way that I've been thinking about this is I've, I've been uh, kind of grouping the properties is, is A's and B's are one group. Those are ones that we, you know, hopefully don't need to worry too much about. Then we have those C properties, whether they're occupied or vacant, and then we have our D and F properties. So this is looking at where the, the greatest uh, density of A and B properties is in the city of Cleveland. And um, just to point out real quick about the methodology here, this is a point density. So all those parcels you saw in Isaac's maps, I went ahead and converted those to points, and then I just determined the distance, or the, sorry, the density. So um, I, I think that covers it. There's one, there's one slide where I want to talk about it a little bit more, um, but for now you can see that most of, that the greatest density of our A and B properties are on the west side. However, we do have, um, you know, a couple spots of strength here on the east side. Um, you know, up in North Shore Collinwood, down here in Lee Harvard, uh, and a couple spots in Broadway Slavic Village. So we don't want to forget about those because those are areas where they're, as we move through the process here, we'll move to our C-graded properties. You can see like those A's and B's in Lee Harvard, they're close to C's. And up here in North Shore Collinwood, they're close to C's down here. Broadway Slavic Village has this nice clump of C's here. Um, and when, when I made this map, this might be my favorite map of Cleveland, just because it doesn't look like all the other ones. We have areas of, of C properties all over the city. It's not just the east side or it's not just the west side. This is, this is for the whole city of Cleveland. So we know that we have areas for us in BNH that we need to, to protect when we go out and do code enforcement uh, to keep those from slipping into the, into the DNF category. Um, lastly, in terms of property condition, I'll just highlight where the vacant DNF properties are at. Uh, this kind of confirmed what we thought we knew based on previous BNH data, but it's always nice to get current data to kind of be like, yes, we're, we, we were working in the spots where we thought we needed to work in. Um, but again, I'll kind of point out um, this area here, Mount Pleasant, Buckeye Shaker Square. Then we had that uh, high density of C's here. And then down here, we had that density of A's and B's. 
So as we work on the Mayor Southeast Side Initiative, we know we have um, some work to do here to protect the, the good housing stock that we have here and here. So that's looking at property condition. Um, next up, I took a, a, a deep dive on lead risk. So Isaac showed maps with, um, with the lead placards and the peeling paint and the bare soil. So what I did for this is I combined all these together to say if it had one of those categories, it was at higher risk of, of um, potential lead poisoning than if it didn't have any of those. Um, so 66% of the structures had um, what we'll call a, a low lead risk, meaning they didn't have any of those indicators, but 64% of the vacant structures had at least one of those indicators. Uh, so then looking at the map here, we can kind of see where we think we might expect to see higher uh, elevated blood lead levels. And I, I think the, the next step for us here is to work with the health department and other partners to check and see if this matches up with where they're seeing their elevated blood lead levels. Um, if yes, that's great, because then the data kind of matches up and it confirms what we're, what we're seeing. Um, if not, then maybe we need to uh, you know, work with health department to do some outreach in some of these neighborhoods where we think there's this increased risk of lead poisoning. So that was uh, what I looked at in terms of structures. I also looked at vacant lots. Um, Isaac had some really good maps on vacant lots, so I don't necessarily want to spend any uh, more time on that since those were so good. Um, but I'll just point out that we have um, 6,000 646 uh, distressed lots. So this meant they had um, illegal dumping, dense vegetation, car parking. So there's kind of like that, that small chunk of vacant lots um, where we kind of need to do some work here at the city. And these, this is the, the density of illegal dumping. And this is where I want to take a, take a moment to, to talk about uh, the methodology in my map here. So this is point density. And uh, residential neighborhoods are going to be denser in terms of parcels than areas that uh, have bigger parcels for commercial spaces or industrial spaces. So Tony being in Slavic Village, I'm sure he can look at this map and tell you where the, the illegal dumping is happening in his neighborhood. But in terms of what I'll call uh, residential dumping, we have this one hot spot here in Fairfax and then this other one down here, kind of where Kinsman, Union Miles, and Mount Pleasant come together. So that's another, uh, you know, so an action point for the future is to work with Public Works to uh, figure out uh, an action plan for, for moving forward in, in these uh, hotspot areas. Uh, sidewalk condition. I spent a little time looking at sidewalk condition. Uh, MoCap was one of our partners, uh, Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. Uh, they do a lot of work around sidewalks. So hopefully this information is going to be useful for them going forward. 75% uh, of all parcels had a satisfactory sidewalk in front of it. Um, that other 25% though accounts for over 35,000 parcels with, with some type of uh, sidewalk disrepair. Uh, looking at where that sidewalk damage is, you know, there are three hotspots on the west side, uh, one in Old Brooklyn, one in Belo Puritas, and one in Jefferson. And there's a couple hotspots uh, less intense on the east side as well. Um, and these are just kind of highlighting the, the main categories of, of questions that surveyors answered. So uh, structures and condition, vacant lots and condition, uh, sidewalks in condition, um, and then I think the last one I'm going to cover is going to be the, the street tree canopy. So in front of each parcel, if there was a street tree, the, the surveyor would note that, and then they'd also note um, the, the relative size of the tree, um, so small, medium, or large. And the, the trees were kind of evenly dispersed, um, whether they were small, medium, medium or large. And just kind of seeing where that uh, street tree canopy is the strongest. Um, and I think I'll just make sure that I mention that this doesn't 
this isn't the overall tree canopy for the city. It's simply looking at uh, the street trees. But this is helpful for our city folks in urban forestry to kind of know where most of their trees are at and um, the size of them and then kind of where we can uh, maybe work to expand the, the tree canopy. So for us in building and housing, I've already kind of talked about our next steps, but I'll just highlight it again um, because this is really why the survey was so important. It allows us to be able to focus on finishing the blight removal, check out all those vacant Ds and Fs. Some of them are already condemned. Some of them are already queued up for demo, but finishing that work and then pivoting to proactive code enforcement. So we really want to look at those occupied C, D, and F properties and see what we can do to improve those. Uh, you know, keep them as a C, upgrade them to a B, uh, take the action that we need to do to, to keep those from slipping uh, any further down in, in terms of quality. So then kind of what's next from a research standpoint? Um, so this is something I've been thinking a lot about, and I kind of highlight a couple down at the bottom that I'm thinking about. I'm, I'm sure other folks have other things that they're thinking about too. Um, but the, the, the chart I have looked at um, the property grades and then um, the historic redlining maps. So um, across the bottom, I have um, A or B grade, and then you can see the colored bar chart tells you um, what percent of properties in each of those uh, redlining areas fell into that graded category. So um, when we think about redlining, uh, areas of the city that were considered hazardous is what we would be is what we would call areas that were redlined. So the case here, those are showing up in yellow. And just over 40% of structures in those redlined areas are now graded in A or a B. Just over 40% are graded in C. And then they also, they have the highest level of DNF graded properties, um, 15, 16%. And that kind of matches up with what we'd expect, right? Um, areas that uh, you know were were kind of cut out of uh, lending, cut out of access to capital, uh, that haven't been able to improve their properties for you know close to 100 years now. We would expect to see uh, lower lower quality property in those areas. Um, So not only looking at historic lending patterns, but I think we can also probably look at current lending practices. Um, you know, Frank's done a lot of research around current lending patterns. I think uh, pairing up this survey data with that has some potential. Um, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to doing is taking the property survey data and pairing it up with the real estate investor activity that the VAPAC Investor Working Group has done. Uh, there might be an opportunity for some tree canopy value added research done. Um, or even, um, you know, looking at uh, blight removal impact. So we have um, the 2015 survey data that Frank's going to talk a little bit about. And he's going to compare 15 to, to this most recent one. We can kind of look at areas where we did a lot of blight removal in the city uh, over those eight years or so and, and see how property conditions change in those areas. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I'll turn it back over to Tony. Thank you so much, Dr. Colby. Appreciate all your great work here. And uh, I know this uh, does open up for uh, analysis in a lot of different areas. Um, and I, uh, you noted on there the number of F Fs, and um, there are a significant number of those that are already condemned. The Building and Housing Department is condemned uh, I think they're sitting around 3,000 structures. So um, and I know that the uh, director's doing that analysis to uh, understand the greater impact of uh, what, the, what the next step is and what they have to do to deal with those apps. So, um, um, and I, I know the director has publicly stated also, there's that notion around demolition. And uh, you know, Alex is on, the, on this uh, presentation as well, the demo bureau, they've been doing a great job. 
um, but there's there's not a push to tear down every property um, just because it's condemned. There, the, the notion of saving properties is also a high priority. So as much as we're, we're talking about um, uh, the issues that we're facing, we also have unprecedented resources and those are being marshaled through the analysis of these plans. So um, with that and, uh, and adding more research uh, and understanding how the context of the public data layers into this, um, Frank Board is going to drill down on uh, uh, on that research and the presentation for his uh, uh, data analysis. Frank? Yeah, I'm going to screen share something that I put together for today. Um, let me just... Uh... Is that visible, Tony? Yeah, we can see that. Can you uh, okay. go, go to full screen? Yeah, you got it. All right. So, so it's not a PowerPoint. Um, it's a PDF, which isn't ideal, but um, it should work. What I attempt, what is what I'm, I guess, going to add here, as has already been referenced, is taking a look at. How does the survey data from 2023 compare to the first survey in 2015? Um, there, I think in the announcement for this, it said that I was also going to uh, bring in and cross-reference other public data. I will confess that I just didn't have time to do that. So <clears throat> when we get to the end of my presentation, I do have some additional things like Tim and Isaac have suggested, uh, what's some additional research that can be done? Uh, what I did do in the past, <clears throat> when I was at the Western Reserve Land Conservancy, I believe I did do most of the analysis for the 2015 survey. And then we did a repeat 2018 survey for just the east side of Cleveland. And I did do a comparison for the east side only of 2015 and 18. Uh, and in, to some extent, this is a little bit of a repeat of that. Uh, what I did do, though, this time, just because I had limited time, is instead of doing it by individual neighborhoods, I did it by the east side of Cleveland and the west side of Cleveland, which is still useful uh, for a number of reasons. As, as I think most everybody knows, the east side of Cleveland was harder hit by predatory lending, subprime lending, foreclosure, abandonment, vacant uh, properties, blight, uh, undermined home sale prices, uh, compared to the West Side, and so, and it's certainly you know it's 80% African American on the East Side, and that makes a difference. So th this is view this as preliminary. There's still a lot of work that can be done here. So the first thing is, <clears throat> and I'm sorry I don't have a nice graphic, either a storyboard or a uh, charts. Uh, I usually do a lot of charts, so I'm doing tables here. Um, so just bear with me. This first table is looking at the categories that the surveys found in 2015 and 2023. Was it occupied, vacant structure? Was it a vacant lot? And so, and I've got it broken down by east side up here, west side there, and then the two time periods. So the occupied structures decreased from 56,000 to 52,000. And I've got a little indicator here just denoting the change. Vacant structures also decreased. And of course, there would be significant demolition uh, that took place between 2015 and 2023 of properties that were blighted. <clears throat> the number of total structures, again, <clears throat> went down, uh, as you would expect if there was demolition. The however, the good news is that the percent of structures that are vacant, <clears throat> meaning looking at as you, if you were driving through the neighborhoods <clears throat> and your eyes are going to be drawn to the structures, you're going to see fewer vacant structures in 2023 than 20, 2015. Uh, vacant land is up, again, due to demolition, largely, from 25,000 to 32,000. <clears> and then on the west side, uh, there's also a decline in occupied structures, but it's not as much. It's, uh, you could almost say it's close to being the same, 55 to 40, 54,000. <clears> vacant structures has changed, gone down some. Also, total structures isn't that different, 57,000 to 56,000, because there was less, again, less uh, subprime lending, less foreclosure, less blight, and therefore less demolition on the west side. 
structures that are vacant has remained virtually the same. It's much lower than the east side at 4% versus 14 and 12%. Vacant land has gone up some, but not that much on the west side. <clears throat> And I'm just, I, I sort of already walked through these, these summaries here. I wanna just go through the, my version of what's the big takeaway from the east side is the increase in vacant lots and the corresponding decrease in structures is a product of the work that's been done to eliminate blight that undermines health, safety and homeowner wealth in this majority black community. The good news is that both the number and proportion of vacant homes is down since 2015. <clears throat> west side takeaway, the west side neighborhoods were impacted less by predatory lending foreclosure and are more intact. While there is some decline in occupied structures, the number of vacant structures relative to all structures is less than it was in 2015. <clears throat> so that's looking at categorization <clears throat> of properties. <clears throat> I need to <clears throat> drink some water here, hold on a second. And I'm going to be looking at uh, property grades. <clears throat> um, I just want to say something about the grades for a moment, and I'm going to touch upon this at the end of my presentation too. <clears throat> the grades are probably the least or the most subjective part of the survey. When a survey is standing in front of a house, <clears throat> And consider we had 20 to 25 different surveyors. Um, they're likely to see the same thing in terms of, is there a damaged sidewalk? Um, is there a parked car that should, is there an abandoned car? Is there dumping? When you get to the grade, that's where it gets more subjective. And to some extent, that, even though I'm gonna go through this and I think it's it does tell us something, but I think that we need to keep in mind there are just some limitations. But with that in mind, uh, East Side, <clears throat> the A's dropped dramatically between 2015 and 2023, from 19,000 down to 5,000. That's a significant drop. The B's also, B-rated properties also dropped fairly significantly, 27,000 down to 19,000. Correspondingly, the C properties increased dramatically, almost doubled between uh, 13,000, almost 14,000 to 25,000. Um, by the way, that is consistent with when I looked at the difference between the 2015 and 2018 survey. Again, that was east side only. The, one of the big takeaways was the drop in A's and B's and the increase in C's. Uh, D properties went from 3,700 in this survey to 7,000. That's an increase, a fairly significant increase. The F properties, relatively the same, didn't change that much, 1,600 to 1,500. Structures with a grade uh, went down. Uh, again, structures went down because demolition occurred. So from 65,000 down to 58. Uh, properties with no grade. I mean, there are properties that were, were, you know, they didn't get a grade because they're vacant lots or parking lots. Um, and then uh, looking at the west side. Now, the west side also had a drop in uh, A graded properties, fairly significant also, 28,000 down to 9,000. B rated properties, though, went up. That's a slight difference from the east side. B-rated properties actually went up from 22 to 27,000. C-rated properties also went up, almost tripled. Uh, so that's similar also to the east side. D-rated properties also increased uh, on the west side from 500 to 2,000 plus. And then F-rated properties, which were relative, certainly compared to the east side were relatively small, but they did go up uh, a little more than double. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So, you know, and I have, I, I sort of, again, I'm not going to walk through these notes here because I already said them, but let me look at the takeaways with you for a moment. <clears throat> the east side takeaway, similar to the findings from the 2015 and 18 survey, again, that was just east side. The A's and B's declined and the C's increased. While the east side still has a significant number of DNF properties, as Tim pointed out, that required demolition. The need for home repair resources for declining properties 
which was first identified in the 2018 survey, is more critical now than ever. And I'm going to editorialize here a little bit. With Cleveland having received $500 million for ARPA funding, I would strongly suggest that home repair should be elevated to a higher priority. I'm not saying that we are shifting so that demolition and blight removal is no longer important. As Tim pointed out, there, there are east side neighborhoods where that is still holding back housing market recovery and stability. But I do think that we, we absolutely need to pay more attention to home repair resources. And this was noted uh, strongly in the 2018 survey on the east side uh, by showing that the A's and B's declined, the C's were increasing. Uh, there's just a strong need to protect the properties that are still viable so that they don't, they don't decline further. West side takeaway is really very similar. While the need for demolition may be less in the east than the east side, uh, the need to stabilize, I meant to say the need may be less than in the east side. There's a missing word there. The need to stabilize declining properties with home repair resources is just as great on the west side. Again, uh, I have a very strong opinion about this, that uh, we really need to be ramping up the resources for home repair uh, and and I and I've said this in the research I've done for bank lending that obviously there's a need for greater lending from banks, uh, but I think we also need to be considering how do we use the resources, especially this incredible one-time resource of 500 million dollars. Let me just give you an example: if 50 million, one tenth of that 500 million was used for home repair. And let's say it was 5,000 per property for roofs and you know various things that are desperately needed. Uh, that would do 10,000 homes. That would make a difference in my opinion. I'm gonna move on. So I also did just a couple sample individual neighborhoods. <clears throat> and actually, I, as I said, when I did this in 2018, I did every neighborhood, at least the east side neighborhoods. I just didn't have the time to do that here, but I do think that uh, could be listed amongst what could be done for future research is to go deeper into individ individual neighborhoods. But this is the West Boulevard neighborhood. <clears throat> I did one on the west side and one on the east side. And this is the same thing. Uh, this is the grades and looking at um, 2015 versus 2023. It's a similar pattern. The A's declined significantly. The B's didn't decline, but not quite as much. The C's increased dramatically. D properties also increased, although the numbers are relatively small. And the F properties, again, are relatively small. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think this reinforces to me the need for home repair resources. And then I took a look at an east side neighborhood. I looked at Slavic Village to make Tony happy. <clears throat> uh, may not make Tony happy, actually. Uh, A-rated properties consistent with what we saw with the east side in general. Uh, A-rated properties declined. Uh, B-rated properties also declined. And C-rated properties increased. D-rated properties also increased. Uh, F properties decreased, uh, you know, again, those numbers are, are getting smaller. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I did is I thought before I end here, I, I told you at the end, I would talk a little bit about grading. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna take have you take a look at two specific properties. Now, and what I wrote here is as illustrated by the samples you're gonna see, Individual property grades should be interpreted with some caution for the reasons I mentioned earlier. The value of the survey, the real value, is that it provides so many pieces of information. All those examples that you saw from Tim and Isaac, uh, that's the real value of the survey. Now, added to that, the fact that this survey, <clears throat> along with the 2015 and 2018 Eastside survey, are also now housed in the NST data system with other publicly available data. That means that government agencies, civic organizations, and community leaders have more powerful tools to guide neighborhood planning and beneficial outcomes. 
So here's, I took, I, I came up with two properties. By the way, how did I come up with these properties? Actually, somebody reached out to me about this property. <clears throat> somebody who lives near it and said, I'm concerned about this property. Can you look it up? So I thought, well, let me look it up on the, the survey. And uh, this is a property in Detroit Shoreway. It's graded F. It's a vacant structure. The NST also reports it as postal vacancy. And it has been tax delinquent for six years. So it's definitely, it's a distressed property. But I'm not sure, based on everything I've seen from the 2015 and 2018 surveys, and I don't think it's even representative of this survey. It just shows that you need to approach survey grades with some caution. This is not, in my opinion, an F property. Uh, it's, it's a D, uh, but I don't think it's an F. Some people might even say it's a C, but it's, it's either a C or D, but it's certainly not an F. This is the Google Maps version of that. So by the way, this was in April of 23. This was in August of 22, very similar. Uh, the same open window. It seems like it has not been closed. There's nobody living there. So water's getting in there. <clears throat> but again, I don't know that this is an absolute demo candidate, an absolute F. So then I looked at another one. I thought, well, let me take it. Let me pick an, an, an east side property. And I just arbitrarily picked, I sorted the properties by east side in the data. And I just actually picked one of the first ones that came up, which was in the Huff neighborhood. Um, and this is graded a B. Uh, it's a vacant structure. Uh, the NST reports it as postal occupied, which by the way, the NST postal data is also, also not 100% uh, reliable. Um, it's 35,000 delinquent. And you'll notice down here, there's a condemn sign. It's hard to see, but it was there when the surveyor was surveying it. There's a missing, the bottom half of the window is completely missing. Um, that means it can't be closed. It's water's permanently getting in there. This is not a B. So again, uh, I'm not showing these to suggest that this is representative. I, I think that most of the grading is probably pretty good, but it suggests that you want to be careful about the grades. And I also think we don't shouldn't be emphasizing the grades. The grades are probably not the greatest value of the survey. The greatest value of the survey are all the things that Tim and Isaac pointed out. Um, Anyway, I just want to close by adding to, I, I came up with my own list of like, well, what is some additional research that we could be doing? And uh, and actually I was hoping to do this and I didn't get to it, but somebody might still do this. Maybe I will, but somebody else could. I think taking a closer look at how does tax delinquency correspond to these, uh, these findings? Uh, and in particular, what about homestead exempt properties? Those are the properties predominantly for senior citizens, also people with disabilities. Uh, have the have those properties changed between 2015 and 2018? Um, and then taking a look at residential versus commercial versus industrial. I did that in 2018. I just didn't have time to do it here, but I think it'd be useful to take uh, to look at a breakdown of those. And then as I'm gonna reinforce what Isaac and, or, and I think Tim already said, is that taking a look at this more closely with respect to investor activity and with respect to uh, lending, access to credit for home purchase loans and home repair loans. So um, I'm actually done and I suspect that, are we on time? Let's see, I was supposed to be done by 1.20. So I'm 10 minutes ahead. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Tony. <clears throat> and I, right. I'm going to stop screen sharing, but I can, I guess any one of us could screen share again if there are questions that pertain to our individual presentations. Would that be appropriate to stop it now? No. Yeah, I can put it back up. I can put it back up. And I'm sure Isaac and Tim could put theirs back up if we need to. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's great, and I and, and thank you, Frank. Again, this will um, this information will also be uh, posted online, so you'll you'll have lots of opportunity to dig down deeper. Um, and uh, we're going to put some questions together um, shortly. But uh, as we're as you guys are looking through these different presentations, you you get an idea of the issues that we're facing. And I, I can't emphasize enough about how this data is going to be used to, to strategically invest resources. And uh, as the uh, director 
O'Toole talked about is um, um, going after uh, business owners and folks who are out-of-state investors that aren't doing the right thing and then helping provide resources for those who are uh, uh, both homeowners and uh, uh, landlords who are being responsible uh, to the system. So um, with that, um, it's an opportunity. Uh, Councilman Harsh, who's been knee deep um, in uh, the housing for uh, both on the community organizing and uh, CDC side, um, and now as council person um, leading the charge of uh, how do we look at this data and how do we use this data and what does it mean for us? Um, I give councilmen an opportunity to respond to a number of the presentations and talk about kind of council's next step and what they're doing on city council side. So councilman, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Marcatelli. Um, so I, I will try not to repeat too much of what's already been said, because um, I think the good news is that um, we're, we're all kind of in lock, lockstep on this, and we're kind of looking at the same data and coming to the same conclusions. Uh, I think uh, Director Martin O'Toole kind of uh, kind of went over what I was going to say at the very beginning of this. And there are, there are basically, to the question of how does council use this, there are two main areas that I think are really, really important to us. One is in operational, and the other is in um, uh, legal and, and uh, laws. On an operational side, um, so we have to deploy and distribute finance uh, money for everything from code enforcement, to sidewalk repair, to grass cutting, um, to uh, um, street trees and canopy investment. And this data is really going to help us figure out what part of the city needs the most types of investments. So whereas you know we might need more investment in street tree and canopy in some of the near east side neighborhoods it looked like huff was a little short on trees there we might in turn have to spend more money on sidewalk repair in south hills where we've got uh, more sidewalk damage there um and and we can balance those issues uh, with the data at, at our fingertips very importantly to a lot of my colleagues is distributing grass cutting services because we now know exactly where all of our empty lots are and how much grass is growing out there that the city is responsible for cutting um whether it's city-owned property or not and when it comes time to distribute those funds and resources we can sit down with those departments and figure out very specifically where they need to go um, to make sure that uh cleveland taxpayers and residents are getting the most bang for their buck um, there's also, you know, code enforcement came up, um, and I think it was a, a person named Lane asked, how do we protect homeowners from sort of beating them over the head with a, with a code enforcement club? Um, and I think that as we look at the parts of the city where the C structures are the most dense, I would agree that that's entirely where code enforcement needs to go. Um, but we also then can parse those into owner-occupied and investment properties. And I think that guides a lot of our code enforcement. Also, what guides our code enforcement is who does it, whether we ask a partner agency like a, a neighborhood CDC to do code enforcement or whether we ask building and housing to do code enforcement. Building and housing is a little more um, bureaucratic. They're prescripted by law. Um, they're all um, you know, licensed uh, state inspectors that have to follow the laws of their licensing. But if we wanted a softer touch, we could ask our CDCs to do code enforcement and they're allowed to just treat people differently. They're allowed to reach out to homeowners with one set of, of, of materials and, and approach and, and reach out to investors with a different set. So when I do code enforcement in the neighborhood, um, I always ask homeowners if they need help, if they are aware of the programs available to help them. But I oftentimes let investors know about the consequences of, of a violation um, and, and the, the, the cost to LLCs. And those are just different approaches based on the recipient of, of the code enforcement letter. And because we now have the whole city graded out, we can look very specifically about what approach is going to work best for each neighborhood. And as we sit down in city council with these department heads to look at the, the wide map, we can all understand the neighborhood, uh, the city on these minute, on these intricate levels together. Because I might know Ward 13, like the back of my hand, I do. Uh, I haven't been up to Ward 8 in years. Uh, last time I was in Collinwood, it was the Beachland Ballroom, right? I went for a concert. And I think I drove in and drove out, and I haven't really walked around um, Ward 8. But if I were to sit at a table with DPS, I can now look at all the data for, for Ward 8 and 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 understand from my neighborhood where, where it is um, in that respect. So I think one big section of this for for the for the city moving forward is understanding how to distribute our resources um, based on the specific needs of each neighborhood. But I think the other big bucket to look at this is updating our ordinances and our laws. And we know that we've got an increasing problem of out of state LLCs um, investing in the city of Cleveland. That's not always a bad thing, but we also have the uh, evidence now that it tends to lead to lower grades on investment, which means that we can look at our laws very seriously um, and making long term changes. Uh, housing 
is one of those things we're trying to look, you know, decades down the road to anticipate future problems and, and try to deal with them legislatively now. I think there's three areas that we are looking at legislation. One is on uh, the um, the treatment of out-of-state LLCs in general and how they're registered in their rental registry and how we um, separate them out from the property management companies that are the ones that actually boots on the ground here in the county. There's also an issue around Airbnbs um, and how we look at those uh, structures and regulate those and, oh, construction and permitting. Um, I think the last thing that, I really, my big 30,000 foot view takeaway of this is that Cleveland is one third vacant. Um, we've got 30,000 some empty parcels. And while I've heard the term right sizing used to describe our population decline over the years, I don't necessarily believe in that or subscribe to that. Um, I believe, and I think everybody on the administration believes that Cleveland can and should be a growing city, that we can attract new residents, that we can build a city for more people. And while some of our land needs to go into job creation, we know that a lot of our land needs to go into housing and particularly affordable housing. And when I think about the future of the city and the way it's going to look in 30, 40 years, I think we all need to come to, to, to terms with the fact that Cleveland's not going to look in 30 or 40 years like it looked 30 or 40 years ago. We're not going to build doubles. We're not going to build the old, huge three-story houses that we used to build. We need to come to terms with how we're going to permit and allow more modular and manufactured housing, how we're going to get more affordable housing into infill, um, because we're not just going to be able to build entire city blocks at $350,000 a pop on new construction. So we have to start thinking about these strategies as well. And I hope that that leads to some change of laws that allow us to more easily infill um, with manufactured and um, uh, uh, modular construction. Um, so those are the three things that are sort of my big takeaway. And I think I answered Lane's question. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop. I, I, well, you, you hit some key points there, there uh, Councilman. I think that issue around, I mean, we, we talk about housing and demolition a lot, but I think your point around affordable housing is a critical point. You know, we, we need more affordable housing and less uh, F housing. Uh, and how we do that and provide those opportunities is, is critical as we uh, look at the analysis of this the, these studies. Um, and I think the other uh, point that you raised around you know looking at different neighborhoods. I'm not sure if that guitar in your background is what you played when you went to Beachland Ballroom, if you were part of that uh, uh, playing back then. Um, but I think your your point around the CDC code enforcement um, uh, is, is a critical one. And, and if you could just highlight a little bit more um, the success rate, because we used to see the, the numbers that came in when you were reporting to the CDCs, of uh, having a CDC reach out and getting compliance um, uh, I, I think there's, uh, you know, Sheila's on here, a number of folks who were doing that uh, CDC compliance letters um, had a great success rate. If you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. No, that guitar saw action at the old grog shop, but unfortunately never made it to the beach land. Uh -huh. um, so, so we did a great experiment. Um, I think it was Phil Starr and some other folks idea years ago to allow the CDC to do more of the code enforcement. What we found was that people didn't freak out as much. When you send somebody a letter from the CDC and not from the city um, about code enforcement, they tend to approach it with less fear. At least that was the impression that everybody in the city side and the CDC side and now having straddled both. Um, I can tell you that when I send out my letters on letterhead, I think more people open them, but more people freak out and get scared about them, even if they don't need to. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not really that uh, heavy handed, but people were calling more, I think, to the CDC to ask for the resources and ask for the help because they didn't feel threatened by the outreach. And I think that your neighborhood has to look at, you know, the, um, the, the I don't wanna say topography, I don't know if that's the right word though, um, uh, the, the population uh, and, and who you're trying to talk to, to decide what your best methodology is. If you're in a neighborhood with just high density of, of investment properties, maybe you just need to pull the club out and go after them with the city with, with consequences. But CDCs have the ability to do this work. And by the way, think of it as like skimming layers, right? If the CDC can do a pass through, can do a pass of code enforcement in your neighborhood and reduce a lot of the sort of low threshold, low, low barrier people, the people that want to, 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 to be active or proactive and get those folks taken care of and get those houses brought up from C to B territory, then you, the, the Department of Building and Housing could then drill down more on the ones who sort of ignored that round, right? I mean, we can layer this approach to make sure that we're we're giving everybody as, as much 
um, notification and opportunity um, to, to, to work cooperatively as possible. And I think that's a good strategy. Um, so I, I think that we you know, have, need to have those conversations both with community development and building and housing about how we can use those partnerships around the city to try to get as much of the work done on the front end by people that are proactive as we can before we have to get into just the very nuts and bolts. So ultimately code enforcement does turn into you know, notifications about what the consequences of violation notices are. That, that's great. And I, and I think your, your other point around business buyers, and I know that's been talked about a lot. Uh, what does it mean with business buyers and how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, uh, and I just I'll show a quick story. I was uh, uh, talking with Director Martin about um, we had somebody in, in our neighborhood who just bought a property, two family dump behind a red chimney, and they were from Qatar and, and, and uh, the Mid East, and they had never been to Cleveland. They had never, you know, they, um, and you just kind of wonder, you know, why that continues to happen. So um, with that, I know we have a lot of questions on there. Noah, thank you for keeping track of the questions. Um, uh, I know you were putting those inside uh, a document. If you can uh, put, put that document up and we, I would open this up to um, all of our panelists as these questions come up um, to, to pop in and give an answer to those. Yeah, I'm going ahead and sharing my screen right now. This could be dangerous for us, for, we're freelancing here. Okay, can you see my screen? Got it. Yep. Okay. Um, so um, uh, whoever wants to jump in on the first one, would it be possible to release the raw survey data from the story map to the public for alternative research uses? Uh, um, Isaac, is that one on you? The answer to that is it is available through NeoCanDo NST. And for those who don't know, uh, we'll, we'll post uh, how to get access to NeoCanDo. Um, in the chat, and then we'll also make that available. It is an amazing tool that we've been using for years. Um, Shanira asked, out-of-state ownership is a pretty large piece in the story. Tony, could you go back to number one just for a moment? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Isaac, the only, I, Isaac is correct. The only issue is that there's a limit to how many records you can download. <clears throat> so if somebody wanted to do substantial research, um, I guess the question is, is the data set in its, you know, complete set available? Have you and Director Martin talked about that at all, Isaac? Um, I'll defer to uh, the city who is the client for this yeah. project on that. I believe, I, I, would, go I ahead. was just going to say, I believe Dr. Liz Crow in our urban analytics is uh, producing some additional public facing data around it. So mm -hmm. Maybe that will fill in the gaps. And I don't know if Tim has more detail on that than I do, but I, I am aware that she's working on something. You, you know, the, I'm gonna find the, out more this afternoon. The, the alternative research issue, like one thing that I that went through my mind in watching this data is I'd love to see this overlaid with a housing value map of Cleveland. Um, we've got some parts of town with pretty strong housing values in the, you know, the, the mid 100s and, and higher. Um, and in those parts of town, they're you know eminently bankable. And then we've got other parts of town where we have very low housing values and we have a harder time getting people banked. And I'm curious <clears throat> if we were to look at these maps of everything from, from grades to uh, street conditions overlaid with property values, if we could come up with strategic ways to improve property values. Because we know the one reason that out of state LLCs and that investors prey upon our communities is that they're easy purchase points, right? There's, there's a, they're, they're cheap houses, they're easy to buy, and they're easy to flip over into rentals. Um, so I'm really curious if we could figure out if somebody could do that uh, research, I would be, I would, I would love to see it. Yeah, I think we have a lot of different research, research points on this. Um, uh, so I think we'll, I, I think starting to break down um, how we use it and what different ways we use it. So lot, lots of more, lots more work to do. And the, the good news about this is it's not just a static, it's something that will hopefully be updated as we go. Um, so uh, Schneer asked about out-of-state ownership, this pretty large piece in the story map, but it's not included in NST columns. Um, can you include that data? Uh, and I think there was an uh, answer on that in the chat, but go ahead. I, uh, I answered it. Okay. <clears throat> 
Yep. Yeah, uh, from what I understand, <clears throat> the story map based this on the tax mailing address, which is in the NST. <clears throat> so the, the, it's true, there is no nothing in the NST that expressly says this is an in-state, out-of-state <clears throat> investor, but the, the tax mailing address is in the NST, and so you can use that. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's probably the best we have. Oh, perfect. Did you find an answer? Yeah. It's almost perfect. There are very, like a landlord never mm -hmm. wants their actual um, financial data mailed to their tenant. So a landlord will always, always, always find a new address for tax mailing address. Um, it's just, it's not good business to have your tenant be aware of your financial situation as a landlord when you're not aware of it. So like whenever the TMA doesn't match, it's almost always an investment property. Um, uh, Kirby pointed out uh, the assessment of change since last survey. I think um, we pretty much covered all of this. Um, and the variations that are shown, I think Frank hit that, and, and uh, Dr. Kobe also hit that as well. Um, the, I, I'm not sure on the next question, on number four, Lane, uh, Urban AI was mentioned as a tool used for this project. Uh, who mentioned that? I'm sorry. I think this that is just me. a... Oh. Go ahead, Isaac. Yeah. <clears throat> So urban AI is just uh, urban analytics and innovation. I think it's uh, it's a city department that focuses on uh, how we can better use data in the city as a whole. Okay, so, so it wasn't was AI wasn't artificial intelligence. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, uh, Phil Starr talked. I asked, uh, did you look at vacant storefronts? If so, how many? Um, somebody I think responded. Who responded on that one? Yeah, so we didn't look at vacant storefronts specifically. We did look at vacant commercial properties that can be filtered out. And so the, the positive of that is we know how many vacant commercial buildings there are. The downside is if you have an older commercial corridor that maybe has multiple storefronts and only one or two are occupied and two or three are vacant, it would still count as an occupied structure. So anything that's multi-use is difficult to assign a singular uh, outcome to. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, Renee Williams uh, asked about vacant lots, about grading systems, once lots of rehab, how do you keep the vacant lots from being distressed again? And who will monitor these? I'm not sure who can uh, hit that question. You know, I, I'll, I'll jump in unless somebody was yearning. Um, the vacant lot issue really kind of, at, at, at the height of, the 2008 market collapse when we were tearing down houses left and right. Um, there was this big like panic uh, about what to do with all the new empty lots and people were applying for side yards and the city was just sort of like giving them out left and right. And it was a, a logical thing to do at the time. Um, but then the, we sort of realized, wait, hang on, we have to rebuild on some of these lots at some point. So the city put the brakes on so many side lots so quickly, so easily. And so really, you know, vacant lots are kind of now boiled into the ones that have already been given to uh, people that have them versus the ones that the city is holding for redevelopment. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the pocket park experiment just sort of turned out to be um, uh, uh, bigger eyes than, than stomach. Um, people were, were really interested in this idea, but it was hard to keep a lot of those pocket parks and gardens going. Um, there's a couple here and there that are successful and kudos to them, but um, most empty lots are now either owned by a person who has absorbed it into their property or is sitting waiting for redevelopment and the city's responsibility until then. Um, I like the key. And I would add, um, yeah. What's that? there's a, a, some great work that was being done by clevelot.org, and I just put that in the chat, um, a link to that. And it starts really doing the analysis of how we look at our lots and what the reuse and purpose is. And one of the things that this study has done, which really, when you can look at the overlay and see where vacant land is at, one we wanted, the mayor's <laughs> talked about, he put $50 million into the county land bank for doing land assembly for, for job creation and, and key projects uh, on the east side. Um, we're looking at how do you have more accessible, whether it's you know good uh, biking connectors, trails, um, and how do you reuse land. Um, the reuse of land is, has become a critical study um, for us. Um, and so we're going to continue to push on that agenda. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we need to get our, our city um, land bank up and running uh, more efficiently. And that's been a big issue that um, the Cleve Lot study uh, kind of exposed that, that, that we need to get that op more operational than it is. Um, and then, uh, uh, Sharon, maybe we should offer some types of housing stimulus to repair homes. 
I'm not sure, Director Martin, if you want to hit on that again, uh, you, you yes. raised it a little bit. I would say, you know, I'd love to see some federal government additional money other than what we've received through ARPA, but our ARPA money is being deployed through our community development department. Um, and it's going to be, and this may answer two questions in the chat, because the money is going to be for largely doled out mm -hmm. to partner organizations who will then uh, mm -hmm. be the entity that a consumer would um, contract with for that money. And I know one of the criticisms is the city takes forever to contract anything. It, it's taking too long to get some of the programs are unwieldy. We know, we know that. We absolutely know that, and that's one of the reasons why it was a priority to work with city council to go ahead and um, work with partner agencies. And so that process is underway. Um, we're also attempting to extensively leverage these funds. So work with financial institutions to create a lot of leverage around it. So the 50 to $60 million that's been allocated for housing initiatives, um, hopefully will be leveraged uh, much um, more extensively than it appears. And I think you're gonna hear a lot of announcements in the next month or so about that. Yeah, and let me let me just put on that too, because um, I've looked at a lot of these too, right? We've put at least $60 million into housing from ARPA. I would actually say that number is probably closer to 70, 75, when you throw in some other projects that are directly housing related. Um, but there's also the potential to put more later. So, uh, you know, the, a $2 million contract was just decertified yesterday. Um, uh, the BIV administration uh, wisely decertified a contract that, you know, was signed or, you know, just didn't con fulfill it or whatever it was. Anyway, um, as, as things fail, money becomes available again, right? And housing is going to be one of those urgent demands. So the more we can spend this money, um, the more we can try to replenish it later as well. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Um, uh, Karen Nelson pointed out, um, uh, uh, first and foremost, congratulations to all of you. Um, and where do you find pushback for your various plans? Um, and uh, uh, so I would kind of open that up, whoever wants to hit, hit that one. I, I think we're in pretty good lockstep with our city council partners and our nonprofit partners on a lot of this stuff. Um, Mayor Bibb is 100% committed to housing initiatives and wanting to, you know, do as we've described here and to become proactive and very aggressive against uh, predatory outside investors. So we're not getting pushed back on that. But I think what we find when we work in City Hall is that, you know, City Hall is a bureaucratic enterprise, you know, by its nature. And we have to navigate that bureaucracy. And I know a lot of us just feel frustrated at having to do that. And do we have more bureaucracy than we, than we actually need to get things done? You know, that's always a question we always have. Uh, but I wouldn't say we're facing a lot of pushback. I think um, everybody is feeling very good about the direction we're going in and what we need to tackle. Um, and I feel 100% supported in trying to take this department into a more proactive direction. Yeah, and and, from, and, and I think that legislatively, I, absolutely 100%. I think Director Martin O'Toole and, and the city council, we, we understand where we're trying to get to and we're working to get there together. Um, I think it's a, a productive relationship on housing. And I, and I think some of the other pushback uh, really gets to be kind of the um, interpretation of what this study and what the uh, uh, results are going to lead to. And folks are concerned. Is that are we going to put homeowners in court? Are we going to be more aggressive? And I know uh, uh, Director O'Toole's talked about, and I know I keep toggling back and forth between Director O'Toole and Director Martin, sorry. Um, the uh, um, but uh, uh, you know that there is going to be a concerted effort to go after bad investors and people who aren't doing the right thing, and there's going to be a real strong effort to work with property owners. And uh, as Councilman Harris talked about, having the CDCs be engaged with that as well. So um, it's not a matter of just going out and, and dropping a hammer on everybody that's caught in this wave. If yeah. I could, if I could elaborate a bit, um, and, and Councilman Harsh, I know you're you're involved with a lot of this. Um, and Mayor Bibb, very committed to not um, being too aggressive with our owner occupants. You know, the idea of creating all of the ARPA funds to allow them to proact, you know, proactively dispatch information on that mm -hmm. and say, hey, 
you know, we're going to be working with our CDC partners. And um, I see Julie Dahlhouse, Dahlhausen is on the call and also Tony Jones, and they have helped me set up regular meetings with CDC. So building and housing is having regular meetings with CDCs. We're also meeting it for the police districts regularly. So we've kept the police very close by as allies in our code enforcement efforts. Um, and of course, our council partners, you know, we, we are really um, determined to make this a collaborative approach as much as we can. You Sorry, know, and, Councilman. No, it's it, it bears repeating over and over. I spent a couple of years sitting in housing court watching Judge Pianca, then Judge O'Leary, and then Judge, some of Judge Scott um, uh, preside. And there is nothing worse than watching a low-income homeowner stuck in housing court. It is it is a feeling where you just like you feel awful just being in the room and 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 seeing somebody that just can't afford to fix their house get stuck into this meat grinder of a legal system. And it's an, a horrible feeling. I never want to have to go through it. But there is nothing better than sitting in a housing court and watching investors face justice, right? It's nice to see people that just get into housing because it's a way for them to make money be held accountable for their for their failure to, to maintain their properties. So I think everybody understands that. We're we, we want to help homeowners and we want to hold the investors accountable. And I think that that's a, a, a fair and judicious way to look at this, right? People that buy into the housing market because it's a profit center for them have extra funds. Um, and people that are own their homes because they're trying to live somewhere run into troubles. And we have to understand that that's the world we live in. I think we all do understand that. I think the, the administration gets that, uh, the council gets that. Um, I think that's just sort of the humanitarian you know, perspective that we have of that and and um if if you can't get uh, please go to Julie and Tony's NST training if if you haven't been through one uh NST will, will open your eyes to a lot and I, and I think that raises up uh, to the next question that Bruce raised um uh about um, outside investors and Frank can really um, um answer answer this as well um but I mean the there really is we we understand we have an amazing number of quality investors um who are doing the right thing providing uh, quality housing, um, really keeping up their properties and, and being a part of the fabric of our community. But these business buyers that have been coming in um, really leads us to uh, having to be more aggressive in things like dealing with state forfeiture properties and dealing with and, and getting BOR back in, in the swing of, of, of directing properties to beneficial buyers, as uh, Judge uh, Pianca used to talk about all the time. Um, but when uh, we talk about business investors and outside investors, it's a whole new game. Frank, if you want to hit on that a little bit, please. Well, there, there are two elements to the question. One is what is meant by outside investors, and the other is talking about the financial gain. I'd like to address them separately. Um, yeah, it is, it's probably too loose of a term, but you know what I think the reason that it's been on people's radar over the last three years is because of the dramatic increase of investors coming from France, Israel, other places in Europe, other places in the world, um, the Philippines, wherever, and then out of state, um, Utah, Texas, California, <clears throat> Florida. And then we could say, what is outside investor? It can mean outside the city of Cleveland. The general impression I have is that the further away physically an investor is from the property they own, the less they seem to be um, really taking care of it. And you know, when we have investors who are local, they're much more likely to be paying attention. They're visiting the property. Um, so there, I would never want to say that you know all investors are bad. Um, and in the paper that was produced in March of 22, we made a real strong point of that to say that we're not talking about all investors. Really, we're talking about this increase of investors who've unfortunately shown themselves to be um irresponsible and what are some of the indicators of that you know how do you know somebody's not being uh, a good investor well the investors who create five layers of llcs because they don't want to be found you know it's not just like there's a company there's a company that's owned by two or three four other companies and it makes it extremely difficult to be held accountable and they know that it's the investor who buys a property and then doesn't pull any permits. The study that we did in March of 22 showed that unfortunately, investors, particularly on the east side, were less likely to even pull permits. So those kind of things. Now getting to the second part of the question, 
what about the financial gain? There's absolutely positive financial gain to the city from investors who are responsible, who do pull permits, who are not trying to hide their ownership. Uh, there's no question that that's, uh, that is a financial gain. But the flip side of that is that there's an incredible burden, financial burden on the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and other governmental authorities uh, when you have investors who make them make you chase them uh, just to find them so that they can be held accountable and uh, the ones who don't pull permits. So I'm probably going off on this in too, too much uh, detail, but I think it was a really good question. It's important to make the distinction uh, that as Tony said, there are a lot of good investors and you can see the indicators of them. They're pulling permits. They're not trying to hide. So, Frank, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't mention the streets of Cleveland are paved in platinum. Oh, well, You've used that, that was... <laughs> quote so many times. And it's true. I mean, I think the, the sales price of homes relative to the rents that our Cleveland homes produce for landlords is really the, the driver of so much yeah. of this. Um, so, I, and I think uh, we'll we'll make sure that we can direct people to that uh, business buyer studies that was done. It, it gives a good analysis of of the distinction between all those. Um, there was a note here from Renee about uh, uh, graded CRD, can ARPA funds be used? I, I think, uh, Director, you spoke on that already about uh, resources for uh, ARPA funds. I did. I do want to note Debbie Wilbur's comment that follows that says what resources are available to help owner occupants who don't have clear title to clear their title. Um, that's a good question, Debbie, because I honestly don't think we have anything uh, figured out about that. And, and we're talking about somebody that has something, you know, like maybe delinquent tax or something else that doesn't enable them to participate in the programs. And I, I think it would be great to wrap our arms around who that affects and how many of them there are and, and what we could do about it. And I know uh, Councilman Harris and some other CDCs, we had uh, Zach Germaniak at uh, Slavic Hills Development and uh, uh, Solid Village working on, uh, especially when you talk about estate properties and grandma's house, and um, it is a lot of work. Um, if there's a way we can figure out how do we clean up title on many of these, it would be an important point. Uh, Councilman? We, yeah, we, we need to actually, and somebody out there maybe can, can be more fruitful with this than I can, we need to figure out how to have more proactive probate outreach because we see a lot of times in the neighborhood where somebody passes away and their kids do not live in the area they're hard to find and houses languish because they don't get into probate and we aren't able to transfer houses um and so then you end up with like a grandkid living in there who maybe could be the legal owner um but because they never got it through court um is still sitting in grandma's name and she passed away five years ago um that's one of those problems that seems like we should be able to solve i don't know how yeah, and that's, uh, you know, maybe we can work with legal aid and, and, and kind of find a way of, of carving out an opportunity to help people get some of this fixed. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I think we talked about home repair programs, making them accessible. Um, that's going to be part of the administration's challenge of, of trying to streamline some of these processes. Um, uh, Steve talked, to, uh, Steve Hawicki talked about uh, being maps made available. Um, the NST is not functional and it hasn't been for several years. Um, if somebody can speak on the uh, the maps, uh, those story maps that you have, I think, Isaac, those are functional as I've been clicking through those. Correct. Okay. So, but, Steve, but, but it is a really good point. While on one hand, the case system, <clears throat> Neo Can Do and the NST truly are just an incredible asset, probably the best in the country, if not in the world. And yet it has a defect. Uh, the mapping function is not functional. And I don't know if Mike Schramm's on this call or anybody else from CASE, but I think Steve's raised a good point. I mean, it'd be nice if that could be fixed. Um, but, but I'd say that having recognized what an amazing resource we have that most other cities don't have. The resource that we have we'll have to put that on our radar to, to look at that mapping function thank you um uh lila uh raises has the city land bank been staffed yet it's still half staff um i don't know if there's <laughs> any update on that 
I do actually, as of this morning, um, Director Hernandez announced at the cabinet meeting that uh, someone has been appointed um, to start mid-July. Great. All right. Um, <laughs> the uh, could be raised investors, small landlords may want to. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, the um, I'm not sure if there is a, a landlord program. I know there was training programs that the housing court used to have. Um, and then when we had uh, 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 the Cleveland Tenants Organization, there was some landlord programs there, but I'm not sure if there's other landlord programs out there right now. Does anyone can answer that? I mean, there's a, there's some organizations working with landlords. I mean, I think the Lead Resource Center is one that will work with landlords to get them resources to be able to update and clean and, and take care of their rental units. Um, the income is extremely generous um, to either the owner or the tenant. Um, but at the end of the day, um, uh, people that are you know engaged in property management you know take on a responsibility. Um, and uh, the good news is, if it's a responsibility you can't handle, um, you know, you have the option to sell the house. At the end of the day, there are three things you can do with the house, right? You can fix it, you can sell it, you can knock it down. Um, but you're going to do one of those three. So everybody that owns a house probably should know those three options. Although I, I guess I will say, too, we're aware of the small landlords that struggle. You know, people inherit homes and just can't maintain them. So that is, we're, we're thinking a lot about that. We're also working with the lenders to develop programming around that, to especially target those small mom and pop landlords that still make up the bulk of our rental property universe in Cleveland. I would just like to say that one of the things that we really have missed is the fact that we don't have an effective Cleveland Tenants Organization. They fill it, fill the huge gap in community, and Councilman Harsh and others, and myself, have been working on reestablishing the CTO too. So, hopefully, that'll happen in the near future. But that does answer the questions that landlords and tenants have. That's a great, that's a great point, Chip. Um, I, we're we're hitting the uh, witching hour here, and I want to make sure. And I apologize for not getting to all the questions. Um, if we can open back up to. Um, uh, I want to do one last round, kind of the last word um, uh, for the presenters today. If we can start with, uh, uh, we're going to go with uh, uh, Director Martin, then uh, uh, Isaac and Tim and Frank um, to get a last word before we close out with Chip. Uh, Director Martin? Well, I guess the takeaway for most of you is going to be there's a sea change in the Department of Building and Housing, and we're pivoting toward a proactive approach, a data-driven approach. Um, and so I think you're going to see some dramatic changes in the year to come. Thank you. Uh, Isaac? Again, I'd like to just thank the partnership with all of the hardworking surveyors from the city of Cleveland mm -hmm. and say that, you know, I think what we're seeing is an increase in vacant land. Cleveland's population continues to be below where we'd like to see it, and our housing stock continues to age at a rapid rate. And those sort of preemptive investments are critical if you want to be able to keep people safely living in homes. Thank you. Um, Tim? Uh, just uh, thanks to everybody who made this project possible. Uh, we know there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and we want to be able to help uh, you know, homeowners stay in their home, and we want to help tenants, uh, you know, live in uh, quality, affordable housing. Thank you, um, Frank. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, ask Chris Harsh what year his Fender Telecaster is, but I guess uh, <laughs> maybe he can address that later. <laughs> um, I really was impressed with Isaac's and Tim's presentations. Um, they, uh, they're they more polished than mine was, and they really got into some excellent additional data that's available in the, in the survey. And I just, actually, I look forward to not only me, but others taking this data. We've just scratched the surface on what can be uh, learned from all of this data. And I, I like the idea that Tim listed some possible future research. I think Isaac did, and I did, and there may be others who maybe put things in the chat. 
Uh, and I think it was interesting that other people, some people in the chat said they would like to look at the data and we should try to help them figure out a way to do that. Um, yeah, anyway, that's it. I don't have anything else. I had carved out 10 minutes for you, Frank. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm quick. Yeah. Uh, Councilman Harsh? Uh, I think it's an O2. Uh, it's one of the last years they made uh, telecasters down in Mexico, so which is okay. better than the end, but not quite as good as the American. So I got the, the mid range. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, in this 18 months I've been here at the city, I think that the work we put into some of these housing changes is the most substantial, impactful work that I've done here. And I think that to echo uh, uh, Director Martin O'Toole, um, we've got some, some, I think, really well thought out changes coming to the housing code. And the ordinances in Cleveland that are really going to help us address these issues long term. Um, so I, I think that there's like a lot of synergy at City Hall on housing issues. We understand that we need to grow the city. We need to reinvest in housing. We need to sort of rethink the way that we look at housing for the 21st century. Um, and I think that's going to be some really uh, eye opening legislation coming down in the fall that I'm really, really proud of. Um, and I think that we're going to we're going to get this one right. And I think uh, there will be some really good things coming. Tony, can I get back a minute or two? I just thought of something. Go right ahead. Well, and I was looking at Josiah's uh, question, uh, and there are a couple things in there in the chat, but one thing he raised is that the distinction between investors who may be in Utah, California, wherever, and the local property managers. And that's, you know, it would be interesting to see not only does the survey data, how does it correlate to investors who have title? But can we then draw some connection to which are the local property managers who may be failing to maintain properties? I, I thank Josiah for raising that. I think it's a good point. And I think uh, Councilman Harsh and, and uh, Director O'Toole um, have been talking about um, that whole property registration. Yes. And I wanna be sure that we, we let folks know you know, this whole the notion of property registration, um, uh, property manager registration, and, and Councilman Harsh has been knee deep in this um, uh, through his real estate side, um, is, is not punitive. Um, it really is a consumer affairs piece for the city. The easier it is for us to access who is responsible for managing the property, we can help them when there's issues at that property, um, and we can be very proactive uh, uh, in our water department and other departments. Um, uh, so it is a consumer affairs piece, but it is important that we know and, and keep our foot on that. So I don't know if Councilman Harsh or uh, Director O'Toole want to add on to that. Can I, I add on something that I failed to do as a lobbying point? So <laughs> in our state of Ohio budget, which contains a lot of atrocities, one of them is the, <laughs> def the defunding of rental registries. And so if anybody has sway with anybody down at the state house, please continue to scream because what this would do is cripple code enforcement departments all, all over the state. You know, we deter we have a rental registry that costs money for a reason because it costs us a lot of money to administer that program and make sure that, you know, we're tracking rental properties and inspecting them. And this would prohibit municipalities in Ohio from uh, being able to charge a fee. For rental registration. So I, I just did want to point that out. Thank you. Uh, Councilman? Uh, no, I, I I concur. The It's unconscionable to me that they would take home rules so far away from us that we can't even govern our own city. It's just unbelievable that that is the attitude in Columbus, that we should not be allowed to govern our own city. And that's pretty much what they're saying. It's terrible. Yeah. And I and I, I, I think that uh, as much as, as aggressive as uh, um, we want to be in analyzing this data that we are handcuffed and um, real estate is governed down by the state. Um, and, you know, what we can do uh, in terms of requiring certificates of disclosures and, and uh, uh, a point of sale or any piece of legislation we do, we still have to get that through the state side. So it's a, an area that we have less control over than folks think we do. Um, and I know uh, Councilman Harsh is going to be working with council members around some of these legislative initiatives with the director. Uh, Joe Titran, uh, um, council's policy and research analyst, is on this uh, and is taking copious notes and will be working with councilmen to um, make sure that this all this information is distributed so we can uh, keep as well informed as possible as we're we're moving down that legislative path. So we're we're hitting the witching hour, and I want to make sure um, we acknowledge the great work 
the chip and the research center has done. Um, and uh, as we continue to look at these initiatives um, and understand what we're doing, uh, these kind of forums are, are critical. So uh, uh, Chip, uh, thank you to your staff and Organize Ohio for, for putting this together and the CSU forum. Um, uh, the floor is yours. Well, I wanna thank all of our speakers. Uh, one thing that Frank pointed out and the kind of granular data, and I hope you guys do this, is go to the individual council people and uh, it was on the west side. Mm -hmm. And looking at the change in the neighborhood that happened from the time of the survey until the new survey, and it was Jay Westbrook's old ward, you can see this dramatic change. And a slight intervention on behalf of the council person or the neighborhood group could make a huge difference in the neighborhood. And I think that individual council people who are lifted up and empowered through this data can make a huge difference in their neighborhood. We have a huge problem in Mount Pleasant with dumping. And to the extent that we can challenge that in a way, in a comprehensive way, through the council person, uh, it would be great. And the same thing goes for our large apartments. But each and every one of us have a responsibility to make a difference in our own neighborhoods. But it's that knowledge base that really makes a difference. And uh, I hope that we can get this information to people so they can use it and make a difference. I want to thank Noah, Nasha, Harriet, and everybody who worked on this. We had a huge turnout for this, as we had for our voucher one. And if anybody has the answer to why 60% of the vouchers are not used in Greater Cleveland after they've been turned out, and has an answer to that, please let me know. Um, it's millions of dollars that we waste every year for poor people, and we need to deal with that. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Frank, for your work on this, all the years you've done this stuff. And uh, of course, we'll wake up the banks and they'll be ready to invest in the neighborhoods. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks to everyone. Thanks everyone.